Hey there, welcome back. This is Phil Fisher at the Phil Fisher Podcast. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hey, Phil. Hi, Sky. How are you? I'm well. You're great. I am. But I, I'm convinced that's a new shirt. It's not. This is a shirt I had to buy when I was stranded in New York City without a flight home and no clothing. You no were nude? clothing? Yeah. You were nude in New well, York I wasn't, City. No, that would be the Naked Cowboy. I was <laughs> I was, uh, I was. was actually there for CT yeah. this months ago. Yeah. Christianity Today magazine. Yes. International. <laughs> and uh, and I was I got a flight there and back the same day I was doing an interview of yeah. somebody and then my flight got canceled late in the afternoon and they said we can't get you out till tomorrow night and I had no clothing so I had to buy this shirt somewhere in Manhattan. Okay, mm-hmm. I won't ask what you had done to the clothing you were wearing the day before that made none of it wearable. Well, I don't like to wear the same underwear twice and it was hot. It was like August and it was sweaty and That's, I you know that ain't underwear. I understand my shirt. That's a dress shirt. My shirt was I was it was New York. You just can't he said I need a new dress shirt to get out of town. Yeah. Okay. We won't there's a whole psychological revelation in there that I didn't I, would I did love not to. buy new pants. Or shoes. I did get socks. So you were just wandering around <laughs> with your new shirt it was and a, no it's pants. It's a long shirt. Yeah. Okay. This is a shirt dress. And we're here with, this is not Christian Taylor, if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, this is Caitlin Beatty. Yes. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. Uh, Caitlin is, hang on, I have it written down. Caitlin is, hang on, Caitlin <laughs> is um, wonderful, very nice, and the managing editor of Christianity Today magazine. Yes. Where she co-founded her menudics. How do you say that so that people get the joke? <laughs> um, it's usually thrown in with a wink. Okay. There has to be a wink okay. involved. But the problem it's is that the second syllable in the name is men. Man. Yeah, oh. her men. So it kind of yeah. so it all it's, comes it's out in the wash. It's almost feminist, but then it's not. <laughs> Can you describe for our audience what her menudics is not the... You know, her biblical but, exposition. Right, your, yeah, the site. The yeah, blog. it's a daily website affiliated with Christianity Today. All articles are written by women. We started maybe are seven you, years ago. Don't, you don't have any men who write anything. Very sexist. Like three men maybe terribly, have written for terribly us. Terribly sexist. Okay. So yeah, we we don't let the men folk come in easily. Mm-hmm. At hermeneutics, but if you go to Christianity Today, you'll see that we let the men folk in pretty regularly. Oh, She's also <laughs> the editorial director of This Is Our City. Yes, which that's is a where musical Sky and review. I, right? Yeah, we work Isn't together. Is that a on musical that. review? This is our city. I think you're thinking of our town. Our town, yeah. That's uh, <laughs> but okay. same. So this is the same. sequel. This is the sequel. Our city. And what yeah. is that? So that is. It's actually no longer functioning, but it was a three-year editorial project where Sky and I and a few other lovely people went around and met Christians doing interesting things in six different U.S. cities, contributing to the common good that the language we used. Common good in the city, for the city of the city, by the city. (laughs) All right. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. It's Phil Lindon here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. We'll talk to Sky. Hi, Phil. Nice guy. And no Christian, too, because we've got Caitlin Beatty here just for you. <laughs> Hi, Caitlin. Hi. Hey, it's a podcast. <laughs> Linden here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Do you have a ukulele on your podcast? No, but I was just getting jealous. But now you're looking not. at yours. Now you're not that I put it down. <laughs> <laughs> I was just getting no. Jealous, I, and then I'm you just stopped. thinking of musical. No, I'm kind of glad. So. Oh yeah, you need yeah. You yeah, need so live music. We just started a podcast at Christianity Today called cool. Quick to Listen, which is a biblical reference. Qu- uh, slow to speak, quick to listen. Yes. Right. So and do you guys do you talk much? So no, they just they just listen. <laughs> it's like a silent it's podcast. Like a, yeah, it's like a bird watching <laughs> podcast. You just hear an occasional <laughs> chirp. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we just started four weeks ago and we talk about really serious things like persecution. And then we talk about less serious things like God's not dead too, mm-hmm. wait, which wait, is what we talked the, about last mm-hmm. week. In the same episode? Mm-hmm. Um, no. no, we, it's a different topic. And that's week to what week. differentiates your podcast from ours. Oh. Cause we would go great, right from persecution into God's not dead well, and I then link probably, it somehow. I'd probably do it the other way around. I would start, if there's a heavy topic, I try to push it towards the end. Yeah, and then you end. Some, it's hard to recover. And then I make up a silly song about it. Exactly. That's why you end with a ukulele. <laughs> sex trafficking, what do you know? No. Well, See, that's some traffic. No, if no, I can't too sing a song about it, then I can't cover the story. But Oh, that's a good rule. Thank you. Hey, yeah. 
But a ukulele is a form of persecution for the oh, audience. So you're, you're fitting that right hilarious. in. That's hilarious. That is just hilarious. Okay, we got a couple little stories, and then we want to talk about um, the cover story from this month's Christianity Today magazine, which uh, Caitlin Beatty had something or other to do with. <laughs> um, college drops mascot named for missionaries martyred by Native Americans. Whitman College, have you heard about this? No, but I'm trying to follow the headline. It's not a well-written <laughs> yeah, headline, yeah, it's, in it's, my opinion. But it's got a lot of M's, so that's fun. Well, it came from CT. Oh, no, it no. did It did. Oh, no. It's right there. <laughs> oh, sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> well, here's our method. first edit that we need to make. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> college drops here. Let me give it to you again, mm. and then you can and you can see that. Oh yeah, now that I hear it again, that really is clear. Mm -hmm. College drops mascot named for missionaries martyred by Native Americans. It does sound like the mascot was martyred by Native Americans. Yeah, we had to drop our mascot because it was <laughs> murdered by Indians. So the mascot <laughs> was named after missionaries who, at one point, were killed by Native yes. Americans, and later went on to start a football team. Right. Right. <laughs> after. Okay, Whitman College is in uh, Washington, right? Washington? Washington State. Yes, yep. Washington State. Ha hasn't been affiliated with a religion, religious denomination since 1907, but the Washington State School still used the fighting missionary <laughs> huh. mascot in honor of two murders. It's like the Demon Deacons. I want to like, know. How did that ever start? I want to know what the logo actually looked like. Oh, a really angry. Yeah, we should. I've, I've been on up. some mission fields. They can get feisty. Like someone praying in like a really angry. Praying, but with one hand behind them way. with a hatchet. Mm. Yeah, they're ready to <laughs> go at it. Um, so there were two murdered Oregon Trail missionaries, uh, and that's they actually founded, or the college was founded in their name. Hmm. Um, the Whitmans, I don't know what their their actual name. Oh, Marcus and Narcissa. Hmm. Narcissa, that's a that's a rough one. That's troubling. <laughs> we were really considering that for one of our kids' names. Narcissa, yeah, yeah, that would have been awesome. Uh, they arrived in the Oregon Territory in 1836. They quickly offended the local Indians after they condemned their <laughs> cultural practices like gift giving as extortion hmm. and scorned the Native, Native Americans' value of worshiping in their own homes. Um, then when Marcus returned from successfully asking the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions not to close down one of his three... Oh, we have a picture. I found the picture. We have a picture. It's, Our, a, it's an angry pioneer with yeah. a rifle holding a Bible. Yeah. Well, we, we assume it's a Bible. Yeah, and, and he's married to Betty Boop. <laughs> yeah, that does look like Betty Boop. I don't know. We, a more modest we, have, we may Betty have to put Boop. this up, Jason, yeah, later Jason in the, in the picture. Jason will put that up but, for you. Yeah. That's, I can kind of see why they decided it was time for a change. Uh, Marcus returned from successfully asking the board not to close down one of his three missions. He brought fresh immigrants and the measles. <laughs> As the epidemic swept the area, killing many more Indians than whites, a small band of the uh, local tribe took matters into their own hands, killing the Whitmans and a dozen other white settlers. Eventually, five of uh, the locals were tried and executed for the killings. One of the Indians announced on the gallows, did not your missionaries teach us that Christ died to save his people, so we die to save our people. Ooh. So the Indians that were mm. actually martyred for what they did to the missionaries quoted Christ as they died. It's oh, like that's an, awkward. It's like an M. Night Shyamalan movie <laughs> where everything just gets <laughs> twisted at the end and everything you thought was I one way turns out to be... <laughs> Twelve years later, the pre-collegiate Whitman Seminary was founded in the Whitman's honor. Hmm. Also, the student newspaper, The Pioneer, will be changing its name hmm. for the same reason. Well, wow. Pioneer is not acceptable? No, you can't be a pioneer anymore. Hmm. Well, but there, you say there's a pioneer in uh, processed foods, and there's a pioneer in cosmetics. There's pioneer just not means an innovator. It's too religious. They're referring to, <laughs> pioneer. they're referring the pioneers to, were so religious. It's the white narrative. It's the white... It's white conquest as a good thing. Well, we see this at a lot of other kind of controversies around mascots, right? Like wanting to yeah. distance the themselves from yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, the past Crusaders. legacies. Right. Yeah. Crusaders. Wheaton College. Yeah, Wheaton Crusaders. College Crusaders and my alma mater, St. Paul Bible College, was also the Crusaders. Hmm. And here's, you want to hear something ironic? Wheaton College, what did they become when they decided they couldn't be Crusaders anymore? Thunder. My college... Couldn't be Crusaders anymore, became The Storm. Oh, that's weird. The Thunder, The Storm. storm. Huh. My alma mater was the Redskins, and my, I think it was my senior year, they yeah. changed it to the Red Hawks. 
Mm. Oh, we mm -hmm. should have become the Crusading Hawks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they flew along with the Crusaders and picked the eyeballs out of the... The infidels. The, the infi yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any feelings about that? Do you think that's the right move? Um, it's interesting. I mean, it definitely speaks to our cultural moment and wanting to be very sensitive to past historical, what many think are mistakes of the past, yeah. dealing with oppression what, or particular people groups kind of imposing their own views. What is it's not a religious college. No, right. it's a completely yeah. secular college with the mascot, the missionary. That's what, right. I, when I read the article, which is strange what surprised me is it's 2016. How did they get yeah. it this yeah. far right. w with having fighting missionary? Right. Mm -hmm. They as, said they, there was a fear that it was affecting their recruiting. Mm -hmm. That people didn't want to be a fighting missionary. Well, I don't want to be a fighting missionary. The name missionary. missionary doesn't have a lot of cultural cachet right now, <laughs> especially outside no. of Christian I, circles. I Even within it, their merchandise right, sales right. were not stellar. <laughs> yeah, the, the missionary branded uh, seat warmers. Okay, uh, second story, and this is related, and this is kind of interesting. At the same time, Stanford students want Western civilization studies back. Um, as the backlash against political correctness, quote-unquote, begins. Stanford got rid of Western civilization it, courses? In 1998, the, wow. Reverend, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, then a contender for the Democratic presidential nomination. Oh, sorry, 1988. Thank you. See, he yeah. corrects my reading when mm -hmm. he's not even reading it. In 1998. 88. <laughs> see, Does see? it say 98? No, it says we I can't that. read it. In 1988... Jesse Jackson, a contender for the Democratic presidential nomination, joined students at Stanford in chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. That, that could be like our podcast motto. Western Civ is, is, is going. <laughs> it's going it's, it's we joke going. about that regularly. It's the end of Western civilization mm -hmm. as we know it, every week in every story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with that spectacle, the university promptly dropped required courses in Western civilization. Fifteen texts that included Plato, Voltaire, St. Augustine, Marx, and Ingalls were replaced by a more diverse canon. Mm. Why they, well, well, couldn't you keep canon. Western Civ but also have courses that right. expand beyond that or even just put the people was, in their context. I think right. it was the requirement of Western Civ that, that huh. people declared was oppressive. It's just so weird. Like, if you're a student at Stanford, you should graduate having read something of Plato. Yeah. Like, this is kind of a right. basic yeah. thing to do if you You'd think. And so are a thinking a, person in the world. It's a uh, student union that is arguing to huh. bring them back. Um, this was the beginning of the wave of protest against Western culture on college campuses in the 1990s that today has seen a resurgence in the form of trigger warnings on syllabi, safe spaces, and policed speech. Um, so students will vote on a referendum proposed by the Stanford Review, urging hmm. student faculty senate to require a two-quarter course for freshmen covering the politics, history, philosophy, and culture of the Western world. Hmm. Against that, at the same time, a group at Stanford called Who's Teaching Us released a list of 25 initiatives and policy changes, including that the next school president, quote, break both the legacy of white leadership and cisgender male leadership. Tell me what cisgender is again. <laughs> cisgender is the, the gender you were born Genetically. It means that you identify okay. with the gender that your that, biological sex. That you were sex. born right. a boy and you're still a boy. And you identify as a boy. You made right. the terrible mistake of remaining a boy. So they can have another male president, if but that they weren't born male. Exactly. <laughs> that seems, That's going to be really hard to do. It seems like a limited recruiting pool. <laughs> I, the whole I. Stanford is also one of the most progressive liberal schools in the country. Yeah, so I the, mean, it's it not isn't, surprising. Yeah, this is not Wheaton College that they're right. ob ob yeah. objecting to. So they, right. they're trying to take one of the most liberal schools in the country and say you're not liberal enough. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so the, I think what they're saying is the next president of the college needs to be non-white and mm -hmm. only male if they weren't born male. Right. Mm -hmm. I oh. wonder if they would accept somebody who's willing to transition later. <laughs> After getting into the office, what if they president? were born white but no longer identify as white, like the lady with Rachel the... Dolezal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that okay? No, that's not okay. Because that's well, oppressive. can I ask a question? Yes, you can. It's not my podcast. You don't even but... have to raise your hand. You can just. I didn't just, raise my so hand, polite. podcast <laughs> listeners. Um, is there any 
like what do we think of calls for diversity in institutional like leadership? Quota. Like like okay, obviously no church or Christian college anytime soon is going to have a contingent on campus saying we don't want a cisgender president. Like that's right. That's not going to happen think, anytime soon. At least not in the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but what about like, hey, we've never had a woman president, right. or like, right. we've never had a non-white. What do mm-hmm. we? What do we? I think assume that of? some of that is happening. Yeah, it would be great if that sort of thing happened organically, mm. instead know? of like instead in the of, form of yeah, protests like a mandate. or so now sure. you, you take you know, so that you have to be like. Um, uh, uh, Mitt Romney and have someone bring you a folder of women. Binder. A <laughs> folder. Binder's Binder full, full of women. Of women. Binder full. Fun note, I'm actually part of a private Facebook group titled Binders Full of <laughs> Spirituality Writers Who Are Women or something like that. It's fun. Well, that just rolls off, rolls the, off tongue. the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> Does it have a nice acronym? <laughs> BF. Yeah, yeah, don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, if, you're, if you're in, if your job is to educate young adults yeah. and, and prepare them for a fruitful, flourishing mm. existence in a highly pluralistic culture that, right. that the United States is, I think it is wise to have leaders on campus, mm-hmm. whether faculty or, or administrative leaders, who represent somewhat the diversity mm-hmm. of the environment which to which you are sending people yeah. to live and work and flourish. So just on a practical level, I think it makes a ton of sense to be intentional in yeah. representing some of that the best you can. Now, there are, especially with Christian schools, certain limitations. For example, if you're a denominational school that is complementarian in your view of mm-hmm. women, mm-hmm. you're probably not going to have a college president who's a woman. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but nonetheless, an educational institution should be preparing people for life in the world, and we have a mm-hmm. diverse culture, and that needs to be respected and deliberately looked at. And so if you have a school that's all led by nothing but white men mm-hmm. in every faculty position, mm-hmm. it's probably not the best environment. Right. But it's- And I think it I think it probably matters for young people going to college now. Like I mm-hmm. feel like my generation like that's kind of a bottom line like this is this is an important value. Right. And so if it if it actually comes to attracting students and if that's a core value for students, right. there's also just a we need to keep going as an institution. Yeah. But so. to, but to say I do worry a little bit about saying, okay, the next president has to be mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and then mm-hmm. you narrow the pool of candidates down. Mm-hmm. You know, in some in, in some occupations, you may narrow the pool of candidates down by ninety five percent. Right. You know, is, I mean, there and there was a movement in the eighties, seventies, eighties, and nineties when when some larger uh, cities were becoming you know much more African American. Say, okay, we want an African American mayor, or we mm-hmm. want you know a Hispanic mayor. We're tired of mm-hmm. you know white mayors, and there was such a rush to you know I'm thinking of Detroit in particular to embrace a particular color of mayor. Mm-hmm. that there wasn't a whole lot of thought about is this the best candidate you mm-hmm. know and there were some rather destructive right this is what happens go well. when you get into identity politics mm-hmm. uh, above is that all what else it is? yeah mm-hmm. i mean and a lot- there could be something even like patronizing mm-hmm. about i mean one of the arguments would be it's patronizing to select someone to be a leader primarily for their skin color or ethnic identity or right. gender Without looking at their qualifications right. or their leadership skills, right. like I'm sure, female presidents in the Christian College and you know CCCU want to be selected because they truly are the best right. candidate for the position, rather than I'm a woman and not a man. The best non-male. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they just want to know, I'm actually the best person person yeah. for this specific Th- this position. has been debated for decades and decades of yeah. the, the the pros and cons of a quota system in all kinds right, of areas right. whether it's uh admission to schools or faculty positions or even in politics so every time there's a supreme court opening mm-hmm. it's it's i think obama recently jokingly apologized for picking a white guy for his new mm-hmm. supreme court justice mm-hmm. but I mean, he was tongue-in-cheek apologizing right. mm-hmm. but there was an expectation you're a black president you should put another mm-hmm. minority on the mm-hmm. On the uh, on the Supreme Court is, is the uh, the the justice he selected Catholic or Jewish? He's Jewish by background, but I don't believe he oh, is okay. a practicing okay. Jew. Because we does correctly. anyone care that we're now like three or four years into the, the first court without a Protestant Christian, and that it doesn't appear to be changing anytime soon? I'd have to think that. 
Do we not care? Like thinking about Christianity Today readers, yeah. really what they care about when it comes to the Supreme Court is where do you fall on the issues mm-hmm. that I care about? Yeah. Whether, whether you're an atheist we tend or to think a Catholic now in or terms whatever. Of conservative or liberal. Yeah, political identity not, rather than not Presbyterian spiritual versus denominational identity. Okay, because yeah. I, was, I was reading some of what people wrote when the first Catholic was named for the Supreme mm-hmm. Court, and people mm-hmm. were up in arms. Right. Because mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Catholics, they don't follow their own brains, they all just do whatever the Pope says. And to put That some... was tongue in cheek. <laughs> You're good. You're good. You must be the editor of a well respected magazine with a long heritage going back to Billy Graham that you'd hate to mess up. <laughs> By the way, I was in Montreat, uh, North Carolina um, mm. this week, last week. Okay. Yeah, which is where he lives. Did yes. You know that? Yes. But he could not come out and say hi to me. But you were in his vicinity? I was in his vicinity. I was at Montreat College. Oh, cool. Yeah, I spoke at Montreat. And people there know him and they see him, but they say he doesn't come out very much anymore. Yeah. And that, that one of them, one of the employees at the college, when guests would come in town, used to drive them up the hill and past his house just mm-hmm. to say, that's where he lives, mm-hmm. but then discovered that security was making a note of it mm-hmm. every time. She, huh. she did that okay. and said, yes, we've noticed you. So she stopped <laughs> doing that. Anyway, speaking of, what were we speaking of? Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. S- speaking of Supreme Courts that you may not like or... Identity th- politics. Comp- yeah, identity politics that you may not like or the composition of government that you may not like. Is there ever a time <laughs> to be civilly disobedient to the government? Ooh. It's funny that you should ask this <laughs> because... Christianity Today, our April issue is a, our cover story is a long essay from David Koizis, who's a political scientist. I'm holding it up. How long did you wrestle with that cover design? We went back and forth a lot. We... Because I was curious if there was ever an image associated. Because the cover, if you are listening, is just black. It's black. With big white letters. That says, when to disobey. And the dis is in gray. So yeah, it's so when it's like to. like a dis. A dis. This is, we're dissing you. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that that's not what we were going. That's like street slang. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> we n- did not intend to diss our readers or any of our subscribers. Um, well, basically, we we felt like this was an important topic right now, given how a lot of Christians in the United States are very nervous that their religious freedom right. is or will be is or maybe taken or away in the near future and wanting resources. Guns. Don't go there. Okay, so I just have to, I have to tell you, I was glad that you brought a copy of the magazine that I could hold up because I have a copy. I'm a subscriber. I have a copy yes, at home. Good. We have a new puppy. Oh no! And and I said, I mean, oh, that's good. I but set the did magazine, he disobey? Phil? I set the magazine <laughs> civilly, not civilly. I set the magazine aside to bring it in, and the puppy ripped the cover off. Mm. He just said, "No, this isn't happening." He knew when to disobey. No, I'm taking the cover off. Right, and he ate the cover. Mm. I don't know what point he was trying to make. I, <laughs> it was some political point. I don't quite understand it. Uh, okay, so why? Because it's on everybody's minds. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I think our readers feel like the Supreme Court's ruling on same-sex marriage last summer will enforce a sort of acceptance for private business owners and for you know, people in Christian leadership to soon have to get rid of their specific hiring right. policies based on like non-discrimination policies being given to so us. So the first thing that's, that's brought up in the, the article, which I think is interesting, is is two cases for contrast. The case of Bree Newsom. Bree Newsom is a young African-American woman who climbed up the flagpole in Charleston, South Carolina to tear down the Confederate flag. Right. She was arrested. Her action attracted media attention, um, and many hailed it as a victory for racial justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, wait, 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 wait. But you got go, the part that I didn't know about until I read the article was oh. the, uh, her, her, what she said to the. Oh yes, mm-hmm. ordered by police to come down. She replied, "In the name of Jesus, this flag has to come down. You come against me with hatred and oppression and violence. I come against you in the name of God." She's quoting David. Uh, the flag comes down today. As officers handcuffed her and led her away, she recited Paul. So, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> she recited Psalm twenty-three. So. It was a very religiously very motivated religious. yes. action it on her part. It wasn't part. just a social justice right. warrior. Right. It right. was social justice in the name of Christian conviction. Right, which I never heard reported when yeah, this her faith, her faith was not. Because what she did was cool. 
and we don't like cool things to have a religious motivation. Ooh. Despite the civil rights movement of the 1950s right, and 60s. Right, yeah, exactly. And how much do we try to sweep that under the rug? I know, it's sad, but we do. He, reverend, he was an honorary reverend. He wasn't really... <laughs> like Sharpton and yeah, Jackson and all the rest. Yeah, those yeah, guys. Yeah, right. Okay, contrast that with Kim Davis, the county clerk who ceased issuing marriage licenses after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of same-sex marriage. Davis framed her refusal as, uh, as a defense of her religion just freedom. So then the contrast is Newsom was celebrated for her courage. Davis was mostly scorned as a religious fanatic and a bigot. Mm. Why? Well, one could argue that she is an employee of the federal government. And so by having that position, she's she's tying herself up with the federal government. So if, if Newsom was actually the flag caretaker... For the, the if city she, of Charleston? If her job... Then, it, then we would have said, oh, that's If her job bad. required her... I don't think that's why. Do you think that's why? Well, I let's think. be... Okay, <laughs> let's be honest, because we're on the Phil Vischer podcast. That's and, right. No spin zone. I think you, one might say that Kim Davis could have articulated her views a little more carefully mm -hmm. in a pluralistic society about yeah. why she refused to issue these marriage licenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but is there also a difference between the perception that that Newsom was fighting for justice? Yes. And to many people, Kim Davis yes. was fighting against well, justice. Well, ma maybe justice isn't the word. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's taking down the Confederate flag is being inclusive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whereas not issuing gay marriage licenses is being, being exclusive. exclusive. Well, and Bree Newsom finds a kind of symbolic power in affiliate or identifying with something like the civil rights movement. We have right. that that image in our head from 50 years ago, which I think most Americans right. would say this that was a good thing that all, happened. Even though many of us didn't think so at the time. We've, we've now we've learned. Pretty much all come around. Which right, is why right. it was strategically brilliant for the LGBT movement to brand their issue as a civil, civil rights, rights issue, issue because right. then they take all that goodwill that's accumulated. Mm -hmm towards racial integration right, mm -hmm. and it's carried over now into sexual this diversity. This is our new, the new right. civil rights exactly. movement and who wants to look at the, all the good that came from mm -hmm. the civil rights movement 50 right. years ago. Who wants to not affiliate right. with today's so, civil rights and, movement? And if you don't affiliate with it then you're the Klan or you're Bull Connor. You're not Martin Luther King Jr. and that's right. bad. That's right. Bad. So Kim Davis ends up on the side of the Klan. In, in this, popular perception. In popular mm -hmm. perception. Yeah. Which isn't good. Mm -hmm. But does it mean she shouldn't do it if that's really what her conviction right. is? Right. I mean, that's, well, huh? that's what the article's wrestling with, isn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. When is and it to okay? to learn more. Okay. Understandably, <laughs> acts of civil disobedience that strike blows against racism and the legacy of segregation, like tearing down a Confederate flag, win easy applause. But acts that don't map so neatly onto the civil rights playbook, like standing athwart the same-sex marriage revolution. Did you ask him to use the word athwart? Oh, Did he no, get, like, but it's so good. An extra it's five so, bucks? It's such a great <laughs> Is there an word. athwart bonus? It's a good scrabble word. <laughs> yeah. Standing athwart the same-sex... An A. A thwart? You could, if you had the word thwart, yeah. oh, you thwart. could just add an A. Yeah. Right, right, right. Thwart. Yeah. A thwart. A thwart. You're such a thwart. Never Athwarted. play Scrabble with me. No, I'm not. It sounds gonna. like an insult by someone with a lisp. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> see, that's, you can't say that. <laughs> but acts that don't map so neatly on the civil rights playbook, like standing. Atop the same-sex marriage revolution seems suspicious, if not dangerously radical. So if you're opposing something like same-sex marriage to the greater culture mm -hmm. seems suspect. Well, yeah, and that's just, that's the moment that we're in. I mean, the, cult the larger culture has changed so rapidly on this issue just in the past 10 years. And right. the Supreme Court ruling was powerful, not only because it's, the law of the land, but also because it has a lot of symbolic power. Mm -hmm. And so Christians with more traditional views on this issue just find themselves like feeling marginalized or disempowered right. and wondering, right. what does it mean to be a Christian in the public square? Will I have to keep my views quiet? Will right. I be able to do my job in the way that I feel like I, I can do with my own conscience? Mm -hmm. uh, at and what peace? Do you, do, does CT have they written anything on the uh, the state laws that are 
all over the place right now. The bathroom bills. Yeah, the we bathroom we bills. have covered some of those. I mean, there have been several laws in multiple states, kind of around these the mm-hmm. issues of North Carolina, Mississippi, Indiana, Georgia. Georgia. Indiana, Indiana was last. It's kind of amazing after Indiana, after what Indiana went through, that any other state would even try that. But didn't yeah. Indiana try it before the Supreme Court ruled? Yeah. They, yes, that, that was yeah. last. <laughs> Phil's being that was around last April. Yeah, but that was. And well, then the, the Supreme Court ruling was at the end of June. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so a lot of people see these newer bills as but being had responses. The, so, yeah, the newer the, bills, the spirit of them is, okay, this is the law of the land, but we still want Christian, like, private business owners to be able to um, follow their conscience without being um, pressured by federal government yeah. to provide services that they that violate their conscience. So, okay, to, to tangent a little bit onto that topic, I, I, I'm trying to study up on what at least happened in North Carolina because that, I think, was the first one and mm-hmm. there's a bit more written on I it. I think Indiana was the first one. Well, I'm seeing post uh, the Supreme Court ruling. Think, yeah, the so Court. the city of Charlotte, the city of Charlotte passes an ordinance in, that included LGBT people in the anti-discrimination laws about mm-hmm. services and accommodations and all that sort of stuff, bathrooms. Right. And in response to Charlotte, the city passing that bill, North Carolina, the state legislature passed another bill that negated right. what Charlotte did, right. saying, mm-hmm. no, 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 you cannot include LGD, LGBT. QA whatever, into these ordinances, which basically says we are not going to make them a protected class Mm -hmm. when it comes to Mm -hmm. various things. Mm -hmm. So the thing that struck me about it, which is kind of odd, is generally political conservatives, whether Christian or otherwise, tend to be in favor of local government Mm -hmm. rather than oversight from far away, whether it's state government or federal government. Mm -hmm. They always argue that about education and things like that. But here's a case where a local government, a, a local city decided... We are going to pass this, but the state steps in and mm-hmm. goes, no, we're not going to let you protect those. Doesn't that seem odd? Isn't that kind of contradictory for conservative? Well, we, we do that a lot, though. We don't want the federal government to do anything unless it's what we want them to do. I guess you're right. Like, you know, if we, if we could, if the federal government would propose mandating that the Bible be taught in schools, mm-hmm. I think we would be all excited about that. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm using we broadly. Right, yes, you, you are. You know, because yeah. you always say, but not me. Not me. <laughs> I say, no, Sky, not you. You're not the we in my we. The Sky we. exception. Right. <laughs> You're not the, the we Jitani in loophole, my as they call it in my denomination. Okay, okay so the article has, um, finally has some guidelines. That's helpful. All articles mm-hmm. should have some guidelines, mm-hmm. a list, because mm-hmm. I like that. People like lists. People like yeah. lists. Lists are, why do people like lists They're so tweetable. Much? They're just easy to media? digest. Okay. It's, yeah. And it's like, the economy of like I don't want to spend all my time reading this article, right. so give me the give me some right. points. Give me some, it's the executive summary within the article itself. Right. Most believers today would support King's vision of civil disobedience. That's Martin Luther King that I was talking about, not Rodney King or any other <laughs> King. <clears throat> Although he was, uh, he wasn't really civilly disobedient, at least as it applied to the glaring injustice of state enforced segregation. But how should we determine whether or when civil disobedience is warranted in our own day when conflicts between government and action? I'm acting this out for the people that are yeah, watching. You're, you're Lots re- of hands. And, and Christian jazz hands and Christian <laughs> Conviction aren't always clear cut. So when it's not clear cut, here are some guidelines to remember from, are these officially from Christianity Today, or do we have to say that these are from David Coises? Co- the latter. Coises? Coises. Coises? Yeah, I mean, okay. obviously there's nothing that he wrote that we vehemently disagree with, but I think there's a lot of wisdom it. in the list. Editor. The list that he <laughs> provided. David um, Coises is the author of Political Visions and Illusions, and we answer to another authority office in the image of God. He teaches political science at Redeemer University College in Ontario. Okay, he's got six guidelines. Ready for this? Yeah. You ready for this guy? They? I want my copy. Did you find they're not really, they're kind of good reminders. Six good reminders. What well, says guidelines? They're the laws. Before they're you start laws. listing them, it says <laughs> guidelines. But here are some guidelines to remember, no matter the situation. Number one, what may or may not be a guideline. The Christian... <laughs> You've, you've, have you found your place? I'm there. Sky, I'm there I'm is everyone there. reading their copy of Christianity Today magazine available in newsstands where fine magazines are sold or ChristianityToday.com, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that the... Okay. Oh, my gosh. That's so fun. 
The Christian life is not simply a matter of subjective religious experience. It is a way of obedience to the revealed will of God in Christ. What does that even mean? What does that have to it's do not just what I feel at the moment. There's, a, okay. there's external the, things that you need to adhere to. The, the, the um, tension that a lot of Christians feel is that they believe, I mean, they believe that Jesus is Lord. They yeah. don't just say Jesus is Lord to me, but right. they really okay. believe Jesus okay. is Lord over everything. So the fact that the Christian life is not a matter of subjective religious experience has inspired people toward civil disobedience. Yeah, I mean, think about, and we, we mentioned this in the piece, but um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was yeah. compelled to disobey <laughs> the reigning authority of his time, not just because... I feel like this is maybe what Jesus wants me to do, but because God was against what the, right. the governing authorities right. were acting in a way contrary to right. um, the revealed will of it's, God. It's another way of saying there is actual right and wrong, okay. right. not just what okay. I so think is right and wrong. Yes. And they do impact how we behave. Yes. Right. Number two, political leaders owe their authority to God whether or not they acknowledge it. What does that mean? Because I always get uncomfortable with the notion that, you know, that all leaders are given their mm -hmm. roles by God. Mm -hmm. And then you look it's at Hitler Romans 13. And, and, yeah. And yeah. you get like, wait a minute, did God vote for Hitler? I don't get that. <laughs> well, that's that's kind of the the example where Romans 13 is like, maybe we've applied this wrongly. <sighs> OK. Like Paul is ta giving a kind of theology of political power, but. I and, think and a lot of people would say Romans 13, power? right, right. When, when the reigning authorities are acting in a way that is clearly disobedient and, and harming people too, um, civil disobedience is a legitimate option for Christians. And okay. we can think of times when Romans 13 has been conjured for Christians to kind of get out of having to do anything. Mm -hmm. We do not need to support theocracy to recognize that the Bible calls on earthly readers to do earthly le earthly rulers to do justice within the context of their offices. So rulers need to rule justly. And if they don't, then you're saying we should kill them. Uncomfortable as a journalist. Uh, no, she's not saying that. That Dietrich Bonhoeffer came to that conclusion all in his own quiet time. That was his reading of my daily bread, not mine. Okay, um, number three. Even an unjust law does not invalidate the entire political order. And he gives a really interesting example. A few years before the Civil War, abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison burned a copy of the Constitution, calling it a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. That's saying the same thing twice. I think that would be like, yeah, but it's Jewish parallelism. For its toleration <laughs> of slavery. A century later, Martin Luther King would appeal to the same Constitution mm. for justice. Mm -hmm. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You can, in many instances, you can work within the reigning govern, right. you know, governing bodies and authorities to accomplish justice. Right. Revolution is a big stick to be wielded carefully, infrequently, infrequently. <laughs> yeah, that's a good word. And, and I think it says somewhere that if, oh yes, when, where a political system can accommodate reform, it's generally best mm. to renounce revolution mm -hmm. and work within the system. Mm -hmm. And you do hear that a lot of people who, you know, like, well, we should take up arms and storm Washington or mm -hmm. we, sh you know, hmm. the number of people that would, I, in the survey that would vote that think we may be getting close to a point where the military should take over the government. Is that a thing that people say? Yes. And it was like in, in among Republicans, it was like 30% okay. that think we're getting close. Yeah, wow. But, mm, there's some stuff I could say right well, now. Well, it's just, I it's, don't think you it's should. a lack of shouldn't. imagination of what can well, actually be accomplished. I also think it's, it, it, to almost justify that argument, it, there's a lot of people who feel like the system is so entirely broken mm -hmm. and doesn't... Yeah. There is no hope of representing them. Mm -hmm. th th that's why they do turn to something as dramatic e either, as a coup. Either a mm -hmm. military takeover or a Trump takeover. Well, yeah, there's a lot of anger. Yeah. If you think like, the system doesn't work, then burning, you don't, you don't want to work well, within the system. it's burning the Constitution, basically. Right. I'm mm. burning the Constitution because of this aspect that I don't like. Or Just, I'm moving to Canada or yeah. Mexico, Europe. Yeah, or Panama. Right. I'm moving to somewhere yeah. more liberal, like Canada, because mm -hmm. I don't... 
or more conservative. Right. Like North right. Korea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number four. Trump is great for North Korean tourism. <laughs> That's a bumper Were you sticker. That as the managing editor of Christian, <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, okay. Number four: contemplating civil disobedience is best done in community. Yes, I think that's good advice. That's why you form militias. No, no, <laughs> Phil. You're. I feel like. The conclusions you're making yeah. after having read this article are maybe not what we were hoping <laughs> okay. for. Okay. But basically, okay. Help me out. yeah, basically, we have such an individualistic view of heroes and, you know, right. the individual standing up against, I mean, both Kim Davis and Brie Newsome, you know, at the beginning of the piece are the examples of voice this. voice rising up but, against the man. Right, right. But Dr. King, of course, he is, you know, he is the, you know, he's the... Mm. figurehead <laughs> of the civil rights movement. But okay. there was so, I mean, he was working. There were so many. In okay. accord with so many, right. Can, you know, tens of thousands of people. In principle, I agree with this. Yeah. In practice, I wonder how useful this is. Only because uh -oh. we now live at a time with digital communication where every crackpot can find a community that will reaffirm what they think. This is true. So. This is, well, it has to be people that you can meet with in person. It can't be but do a the, social media. Do the crackpots really have that much political power? Apparently they do. Have you seen what's going on right now? <laughs> I've seen who's leading the Republican I, I just think, honestly, though, if, if you are sort of about any issue, like we, we were joking before the podcast about a, a blog post that I found that someone else had written saying that adult coloring books are demonic. Mm -hmm. And given the Internet, you can find a community of people who will agree with you on that and 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 fund or encourage your revolt against right. everyone with adult coloring books. But how far but just, can you get with only a virtual militia? And Not that far. And just because, like, the crazy people do find each other mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the good people don't need each other. Oh, I agree. I, I, I like I, mean? I said, I yeah. agree in principle that this, yes, we should be doing these things in so community. If, I mean, Westboro Baptist is a community that has some kind right. of funding structure of people right. that say, yeah, go do that. So just because you, you can't just say, well, I have a community, therefore what I'm doing is right. No, no. That's not often enough. The people who are doing the right things do have a community yes. behind so, them. So we had at our church, we had a guest speaker say something a little politically controversial. Uh, we had a family in the church write very angry mm -hmm. emails. I was, I'm an elder. Mm -hmm, you know, this mm -hmm. is about a year ago mm -hmm. or more. Uh, very angry emails that we needed to get up and we needed to denounce that guest speaker okay. um, because of a very specific political point of view right. that this family held. Right. We, the elders, refused to do that. Mm -hmm. And we actually said, would you come and speak with us about mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. And the family refused to do that and left the church. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's an example of this actually working right. You know, mm -hmm. where where they were in community, they tried to reach out to community. The community said, you know what, you're going a little overboard here. Right. You're it going was a, check. a little wacky, but we don't like that because yeah. we're rugged individualists. Right. And so rather than accepting, you know, the, the view of the, their community, they yeah. left the community. And my hunch is they probably found a community that will reinforce mm -hmm. the view they would like to hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, but it was still it's generally a good thing to yeah. go to mm -hmm. be in, it is. in community. There are but checks and balances it, in a community. Yeah. It, I, yeah. Yeah. Although I did notice something uh, that my brother, I was going over notes from my brother's uh, um, class at Okaboji from a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and he was giving people political advice. And, and one of the things was, if all of your friends agree with you, find more friends. Mm -hmm. And if all of your uh, sources of news <clears throat> agree with you, find more sources of news. Right. We're you know, in a pluralistic so culture. There's diversity of ideas. Make sure your community is not in lockstep with you, mm. which is And scary. that actually brings us back to the Stanford story that you brought up, yes. which is kind of an, an inability among some of the students to tolerate um, multiple perspectives, even if it's like a Western white yeah. perspective. There's a sort yeah. of there's a way in which political correctness actually just becomes a different. A sort of it can become a form of exclusion and oppression, or or a narrow a narrow way of thinking. Mm -hmm. right. You know. Right. Okay. Number five. So we we agree with that one. 
Yeah, Sky <laughs> Sky puts an asterisk behind. I it. I think it's a great one. I just I, it took performance enhancing drugs. So it's great. I love it. Okay, it just isn't complete. <laughs> Number five. Well, well, what's the completion of it? I'm saying well, by we're it, you your can't community, yeah. and we're saying you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying so it's a great thing, but you can't yeah. just rely on community because your community might be as crazy as you are. There is not only strength in numbers, but wisdom as well. That's directly from the article. Yes, the mob is always wise. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> my point. Is sometimes, I mean, I mean, Some, we've talked openly about Donald Trump on this podcast. Everyone yeah. knows what I think about. Yeah. There is, there are millions and millions of people who are voting for Donald Trump. Yeah. And you can go in like, oh, well, millions of people can't be wrong. We must mm. be, you know. So you yeah. can't just look at. Large numbers of right. people agree with me, therefore I'm okay, right. Okay, so how, what do you ask? Lots of people agreed with the Nazis. What, what's in your asterisk? I knew the Nazi Trump, Trump comparison. Yeah. I didn't say Hitler. Oh. I didn't say Hitler. Oh. I said I just said oh. large groups of people can be wrong. Yes. They're not always yeah, right. Sure. So, so I think if you include, I mean, this is one in a list of recommendations. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, I'm just saying don't. Four of don't six. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I'm saying don't, don't take, take the, this out of. Okay, don't yeah. proof text. Right. Yeah, this, yeah. This list. Right. right. This otherwise scripturally sound list. <laughs> okay, number five, the means of civil disobedience matter as much as the ends. Yeah. So we can't just do whatever we want if the end is good? Well, even, so speaking of Bonhoeffer and yeah. Hitler, like even Bonhoeffer wrestled with the potential to kill, you know, he was involved in these assassination attempts against Hitler and obviously none, right. none of them were successful. But he actually believed that the means justified, the ends justified the means. And mm -hmm. he actually believed that one of the ends would be that he was, Damned. He himself was damned. He was willing. Whoa. The Phil Vischer show just got really serious. Whoa, I can't sing a um, song about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I mean, that is actually a really compelling example of, mm -hmm. man, if there were any right, end right. where the means would justify it, yeah. killing Hitler would be like a pretty compelling end. But even... You know, ultimately, Bonhoeffer chose the way of peaceful resistance and end mm -hmm. up martyred um, because he couldn't, he didn't, wasn't successful in the assassination. Attempt. Most of us are probably not going to face that dramatic a decision. Mm -hmm. Where we so, get to kill Hitler? Right. Yeah. So only if we could. Right. Well, I think I'm thinking of Kim Davis again. Okay. Uh, agree or disagree with her view. The question is, what would have been perhaps better means to express mm. her conviction mm -hmm. other than the ones that she chose. I'm th here's what com comes to my mind. I had a friend in college, a good friend of mine, and for personal reasons, he was wrestling greatly with issues of uh, LGBT stuff. Not, he himself was not gay, but he was very close to some people who were, and he didn't know how to deal with it, and he's conservative in his mindset about that as a Christian. And his way of dealing with that was to become very close friends with people on campus who were gay and started participating in going to meetings of LGBT groups on campus. Mm -hmm. And he was clear in, with his, in his relationships with them about what he thought theologically and biblically and all mm -hmm. that about these issues. But his way of dealing with that was getting to know them, moving closer rather than protesting, you know, mm -hmm. things that were going on on campus or whatever. And I thought, wow, you know, that's a... That's a Christian response to a, right. to a tough problem. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we all know people who feel strongly about abortion, mm -hmm. and many of them choose that we're going to protest this evil by helping women or by mm -hmm. adopting right. children, right? That's right. a form of engagement in the issue, which is not just... But many would say that it's, it's not an either-or it's yeah. a yeah. both and. Right, but there are times where we, I think we get so aggressive as Christians against something that we do more harm than good. And actually, this is a segue into another article that ran in the issue. No way. The April issue of Christianity Today. So Karen Swallow Pryor, who writes for us frequently and teaches at Liberty University, was very heavily involved in the activist side of the pro-life movement. So mm -hmm. she and her uh, fellow activists would go to abortion clinics and, you know, stand there and eventually be taken away from police. And we're also communicating with women who were going in and out of the clinic as well to offer help. But she got she arrived at this conviction after years of doing this, that the rhetoric that her activists, she and her activists was using, were, it was so dehumanizing to people on the other side of the issue and like pushing them farther away. And so now mm -hmm. she's really left the more um, protest mm -hmm. side of the pro-life movement because of the way that it actually, she feels like 
part of it did more harm than good. So like means yeah. matter. Yeah. You know, and there with that issue, there are many ways to care for unborn life. Right. And it's not just protest. And if I can contradict myself, there were plenty of people who were criticizing Martin Luther King saying, you know, just be more patient. You don't have to organize mm-hmm. these protests. You right. know? And, right. and he wrote that very compelling, uh, great letter from the Birmingham prison mm-hmm. explaining why this, he right. was using the, but, the... And he was at the same time responding to the people who were saying, we need to use violence. Right. We the, need the, to, right. Malcolm X's we need, and They're those doing types. it to mm-hmm. us. And that's what actually, that's one of the things that scares me the most about Donald Trump is his arguments for torture, his arguments mm. for things that the Christian West has set aside as morally unacceptable mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with the argument that, but they're doing it to us. Right. It's or a the schoolyard. Yes. The yes. I mean, uh, yeah. honestly, if, if Donald Trump was involved in the civil rights movement, people would have died because M- anything. More people would have died. They, well, yes. Well, you, you don't know. He may take up arms to, you know, free died. orange people. <laughs> Okay. And number six, <laughs> uh, number six, finally, as Dr. King readily acknowledged, anyone engaging in c- civil disobedience must be prepared to suffer the consequences. Why, yeah, why even is, bring that up? This is just a sober reality, you know. It means so we might actually get in trouble? You might have to step away from your job, you know, uh, or you might have to step down or you might have to somehow um, give up some form of cultural power. Or be made to, I mean, I'm sure Kim Davis feels like she was maligned and made fun of and, but in her mind, she was standing up for the truth or standing up for her beliefs. And so that was the cost for Mm -hmm. her, you know, Mm -hmm. obviously people who have disobeyed the government have suffered far worse consequences, including the early Christians who were willing to die at the hands of Roman soldiers. Yeah. And on that note, I think it's worth Christians who are experiencing anxiety or fear in our current culture to to take the long historical view yeah. mm-hmm. and to mm-hmm. ask are you know is is persecution what's happening or are we just experiencing a loss of power that we've actually enjoyed right. for many many right. many years right. is it a loss of privilege not a loss of rights um, and are we willing to give up some power yeah you know okay let me add one other thing into this I think it's a great point you really do need to consider the consequences but I just finished rereading the book Silence. Does anyone, mm, you know, mm-hmm. with uh, Susuku Endo? Shusako. Susaku, Sako, so whatever. Endo. We'll just call him Endo. Um, <laughs> he probably doesn't need a brand name. Probably not. It's a beautiful book. It's a wonderful book. It's His a challenging book. cards will, will rise up the chart at uh, Walgreens. Well, now. Martin Scorsese is making a movie about it. It's right. releasing in November, I think. Oh. Anyway, everyone Ding. should read that book. But the thing that it brings up is you don't just have to consider the consequences for yourself Mm. if you're going to be civilly disobedient because of your faith. You have to factor in what costs will there be to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, you could think immediately of the cost to my family, right? If I suddenly Mm -hmm. get imprisoned or whatever. But there is a broader cost. Kim Davis, whether you agree or disagree with what she did, there was not just a cost to Kim Davis. There's a cost to the reputation of the church in North America mm. because of what she did, the perception of what she did. And mm-hmm. there is a cost going on right now to some of the laws being passed that mm-hmm. appear to be uh, or framed as bigoted toward LGBT people. There's a cost to the reputation of the church right. and Christ well, that isn't just toward you or the pol- politician Especially involved. when we're making so much of a greater deal out of gay marriage, for example, than we are out of poverty or, mm-hmm. you know, other issues where right. the state makes decisions that affect people's lives. Mm-hmm. We've we've clustered around such a small group of social issues, you know, because it's hard to it's hard to have a big list. <laughs> we, want mm. a, we want a small mm-hmm. list. But from the you know 1970s on, it's just a couple of things that we've really picked and said, this is this is all we care about. Mm. We need to be broader. And yeah. We'll, we'll, well, and I, the other I think we have broadened. We I think we are have. broadening. I think we have broadened. Yes, we have we and are, will continue to broaden. Broadening. <laughs> but I do think <laughs> we, the reason that, you know, in mainstream media, Christians kind of have this reputation of being obsessed with abortion and gay marriage are these are issues around which the mainstream culture has kind of made a, made a decision right. that we feel to be yeah. in tension right. with. Those right. are kind of the tension or pain points. Like no right. one, no one is saying in the mainstream culture is saying like poverty is not a real issue. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's a consensus yeah. around a lot of, right. No okay. one's saying like human trafficking, trafficking yeah. is good. Those are just, 
Yeah, but there's also, a, I think, a transition that's occurred where traditionally Christian activism in our country, going back to slavery, civil rights movement, Christian activism has tended to be uh, to seek justice for the oppressed or to seek mm-hmm. justice for those who have mm-hmm. no voice. With the LGBT issue mm-hmm. and religious liberty, it feels a whole lot more like Christians are seeking protection for themselves. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't sit well right. with a culture that says Christians should really be for the other. Mm-hmm. And so we look self-serving. And when when Kim Davis says, I'm not going to hand out marriage licenses because it violates my conscience, she's not protecting anyone else. Mm-hmm. She's protecting herself. Although and she probably saw herself as protecting other Christians who perhaps. are in similar But even then, situations. it's still about Christians protecting Christians. Mm-hmm. It's not Christian about... principles. Not Christians. But that's how Christian it's perceived. Principles. I think it's different when we... Even when you stand up and, and, and block access to an abortion clinic, you can make yeah. the argument, we are trying to protect an unborn the child unborn, right. who doesn't have a voice in this. Yeah. scenario. Yeah. Whereas when you protest a gay couple getting a marriage certificate, yeah. it's much yeah. harder to make the case that you're protecting someone other than your own self and your yeah. own interests. Well, and the question is asked, uh, is is the gospel going to be harmed by, for example, doing doing the wedding cake for a gay couple? Right. You know, if you have the freedom not to participate in the ceremony or whatever, right. if to or to right. provide right. flowers for this same-sex couple is that really what's at stake basically right. and if it's if it's just your own personal conviction there's a lot less patience i think for right. that kind of argument exactly and i think that's where a lot of the heat comes from now in the in the christian activism is it seems self-seeking hey self-serving guy. yay do you know what it means when I start playing? Yeah, I know. You're <laughs> plucking away over there. I'm just trying to ignore it. It means we're out of time. Right. Yeah, you're not just trying to ignore it. You're succeeding. I'm civilly so disobeying. I can't blame Caitlin because she's never been here before. <laughs> but you are making me run long. I'm just sticking it to the man. Okay. You're what? civilly disobeying. Why am I the man? Because you have the ukulele and it's oh. the Phil Fisher oh, podcast. Oh, whoever has, is the ukulele is the man? He's the, is it's this like, your new rule? It's your the alternate conch. universe? <laughs> Holy smokes. Okay. Hey, hey, would you like to like to disobey because of abortion or marriage that is gay? Well, we got a list of guidelines here from Caitlin Beatty and Christianity Today. Oh, hey, hey, so get a subscription today because the magazine business is going away and we need to keep it going so they can make lists so we know when, when it's worth it to raise our angry fists and protest. Hey, thanks for being on the show. That was pretty good. Caitlin Beatty, thank you. Well, thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Caitlin. It's been on me. so long, I had time to try to think of something. Yeah, so you <laughs> should thank me. <laughs> All right, we will see you next week. Bye. See you guys. Bye.